Uh, my name is Mike Goodness. Uh, I'm a systems engineer on the Kubernetes team at Ticketmaster, joined by my colleague and coworker, Raphael, who is also a systems engineer on the Kubernetes team at Ticketmaster. Um, before we get started, I have a couple of notes. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to say hi to my uh, family and friends who are watching this on YouTube, despite not having any idea what I do for a living. <laughs> Uh, secondly, I want to apologize again to everyone who's watching and uh, was hoping to see some sweet uh, Lord of the Rings memes, uh, given the title of the ch talk. Um, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Um, although I could say at Ticketmaster, one does not simply cube cuddle create. A <laughs> uh, little background. Um, I have a couple of years of production experience with Kubernetes, uh, both at Ticketmaster and at my previous company. Um, I'm a Helm Charts contributor and co-maintainer. Recently uh, became a CNCF ambassador and I co-organized the DevOps Days Madison uh, conference. Um, let's see, my name is Raphael Deem. I'm an open source enthusiast. I maintain the SANIC, which is a Python web framework. Uh, also. Pretty new to Kubernetes, probably started using it about six months ago, and this is my first time speaking in front of so many people. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the code there is, you know, be gentle. Um, this is what we're gonna talk about. Uh, I, it, we're, we're gonna keep it, you know, kinda nice and tight, hopefully. Um, <laughs> We are going to kind of assume uh, uh, some, familiar, some familiarity with Helm. Uh, I will cover a few of the basics, but uh, you know, um, I'm also going to be picking apart or kind of dissecting a few sections from our, uh, our web service chart. And it's going to assume some uh, knowledge of how Helm works and Kubernetes manifests. Um, but I, this seems like a, a good crowd to have, uh, to have kind of that baseline. So anybody who's uh, worked with Kubernetes knows that um, you're working with quite a bit of YAML, like lots of YAML. Uh, you want to deploy some pods, so at the very minimum, you need a deployment, YAML. You probably want to expose those pods behind a uh, uh, load balancer, so you have a service, YAML. You may or may not, well, I mean, assuming you want to actually be able to do anything with those pods out, you know, from outside the cluster, you want an ingress. Say it with me, YAML. <laughs> uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna show every possible <laughs> resource because as we all know, there are a lot of APIs now in Kubernetes and each one involves YAML. So, uh, you take you know, all, of those, all, of the, all of that YAML file that goes into uh, building an application, deploying an application to Kubernetes, you multiply that by you know, uh, the number of clusters that you may have in your environment, you know, and, and each one has a certain, you know, certain configuration points that, you know, that are different than the others. Um, you need to deploy different versions of the same application and each, you know, some of them have, uh, I mean, at the very least, your Docker image tag is going to be different. So that's, you know, that's a different configuration point. You know, the problem uh, with Kubernetes as it is today is there's no real way to bundle all of those applications, no native way to bundle all of these resources, all these manifests together into a, into a single unit, you know, into what we really think of as um, a deployable application. Uh, we have labels, and that's, you know, that's the native mechanism, but there's, there's no real enforcement, you, you know, you, you um, other than manual manipulation, making sure that you know, each manifest has a label you know, to, to create that association. There's no other real mechanism for it. And that's where Helm comes into play. So Helm, uh, again, at a high level, uh, allows you to treat your Kubernetes application as a single unit. It provides um, a rendering engine, uh, most, uh, mostly focused on Go template, though that is uh, pluggable with uh, a, a great deal of difficulty. Uh, it provides a package and application manager. Is that Butcher? Did I hear Butcher laugh? No? All right. Um, <laughs> uh, 
so it, it can act uh, as your application, your package manager, uh, akin to uh, you know the way Aptium or APK works for your uh, Linux distribution. And then it also uh, provides a release manager, so that if you're deploying the same application multiple times, you can track that release. You can you can um, you can track those those related manifests or those related resources and alter them. Um, as a single unit. Uh, some terminology really, um, and you know, I should have put this bullet point last, obviously. Uh, when we refer to Helm, we are, you know, we're gonna be referring to uh, the complete application, but it's also specifically the client side. Uh, Tiller uh, is the server side application that actually lives in your cluster and communicates with the API server. So, um one of the reasons we did this is because we have a lot of clusters. Uh, last we counted, there are 15 total. Uh, we have hybrid cloud, so we have AWS and on-prem. We have uh, different regions for each of those, and we also have multiple environments. <coughs> um, so as you can see, that's quite a few clusters there. Uh, we also have <coughs> uh, one namespace per team. So every team gets their own. Um, oh namespace. Uh, this is facilitated through, uh, we have a tool called Namespace Creator internally, kind of like how GitHub was, if you went, uh, heard that in the keynote, they have something similar. Um, so the team, uh, basically a product team that wants to use a Kubernetes cluster will fork a repository that has a list of the enabled namespaces and add their um, product code to it. And then that will uh, perform some validation to make sure, for instance, um, that they have one thing that we enforce is that they have a contact, uh, technical contact filled in another system so that if their stuff goes down, we know who to reach out to. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the namespace creator also provides role-based access control via Active Directory groups. So if um, you, know, you wanna give somebody access to that namespace, you add them to an uh, Active Directory group. And um, it also enforces resource quotas on the entire namespace and deploys Tiller, the server side of Helm, uh, for each namespace to isolate things, uh, the resources and the creation of them and everything is separate. Uh, finally, another detail here is that we have multiple, as a result of having the hybrid cloud, we have uh, AWS um, ingress controller, which uses the uh, <coughs> application load balancing ingress controller, which we developed jointly with CoreOS. And then uh, on-prem, we just use the standard Nginx ingress controller. But as a result of all these uh, complications or you know different details, that's essentially why we developed the web service chart. So yeah, as Raphael said, this uh, we refer to our, our, our common uh, a Helm chart as the web service chart. We really couldn't get any more generic of a title than that. Uh, we developed it originally, uh, so our original approach was that it would be uh, just kind of a template for teams to fork and customize as needed. Um, that's you know that's a pattern that we've seen in the in or that we've used in the uh, community charts repo. You know each application has its own chart. It is tuned to that application's needs. And as it needs to be extended, PRs are filed against it, and we, um, you know, we integrate those changes. Uh, there are some pros and cons, as there are to everything, uh, to that approach. The pros, as I mentioned, is that, uh, or you know, the, the single pro, really, <laughs> the biggest one, is that uh, that chart is tuned to specifically to that application. There, there are no extra configuration points to confuse a team or to, you know, to um, conflict or just to you know, cause problems. It's, it's very purpose-built. Uh, the cons are that you know, there, there's, no, there's no commonality between those charts. So um, when team A you know, discovers a new way to do something, um, team that, that's not easily communicated or shared with team B. You know, there's no uh, shared best practices. Uh, or you know, not, it, 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 at least not easily. You know, it requires some manual intervention, people actually you know, talking to each other, which, yeah, you're right, yeah. <laughs> um, but then you know, kind of the, uh, the inverse is that when, uh, there's, where, when there are cluster changes, uh, you know, whether it's something that we've done to 
uh, add or remove functionality, uh, we being the cluster ops teams. Um, we then need to communicate those changes back to the teams. Again, communication. Um, man, all right. Uh, or when there's an upstream bug that is either uh, discovered or fixed that requires a change in chart functionality, that needs to be shared. So it's just, you know, it, it's, it's all about sharing and the difficulty therein. So a few months ago, uh, we decided to kind of flip that. Uh, and as you can see from the bullet points, like really flip it. <laughs> so now the Kubernetes team maintains that web service chart manually uh, and we share it across all the teams. So when a team uh, deploys an application using the chart, they point to our, you know, to that one Helm uh, repository, to that one chart in the Helm repository rather than, um, you know, having a team A chart and a team B chart. Uh, so the pros, again, as you can see, are, are again, flipped. You know, we, we have some, there, there's no need for commonality because there is only one chart. Uh, team A deploys that chart using the same values um, or the same, you know, the same options are available to team A as are available to team B. Um, if a team discovers a new, better way to do it, they can submit those improvements via PR. Likewise, when we change something in the, in the cluster or there's uh, an upstream change, we can integrate that into the cluster, cut a new version, and you know, send that out to the teams who um, you know, then update their pipelines so that they're deploying using that new version of, um, of the chart. This has worked out you know, really pretty well so far. Um, I don't know if, you know, uh, I don't know how long it'll work, you know, before we have some really customized applications that need, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, need special care and attention, but we're hoping that this can uh, get us pretty far. So uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, kind of a la uh, Vic Iglesias' uh, demo yesterday of the community charts best practices is dive into some of the um, some of the things that we've done in the web service chart to support uh, deployment to hybrid cloud and uh, account for the differences between those environments. So uh, basic structure here, uh, we have the usual, uh, 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 the usual components of a Helm chart, uh, our chart YAML, you know, metadata, we have the templates folder, and then our values file. So I'm gonna dig into the values file and uh, because I'm using a large terminal, this is going to be lots of scrolling. As you can see, this values file is 251 lines long, 6,256 characters. So to say we provide a lot of knobs and dials is putting it somewhat mildly. Uh, a few, I'll, I'll go through a few of these uh, options. So we have things like, um, uh, you know, uh, configurable AWS region, uh, IAM role, revision history limit. Let's get to some more interesting ones. Uh, affinity, uh, if a team, and most teams have, have actually adopted this, we're probably gonna flip this bit um, because most teams do want to uh, have some anti-affinity so that their pods get spread across availability zones. Here, we have that set to false just because that is kind of the, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not out of the box behavior, but again, uh, we're probably gonna flip that pretty soon. Um, a couple of things that I will mention uh, in just a few minutes uh, are replica count and max replica count. So these come into play when creating the deployment. Uh, max, replica count is, you know, the number of replicas, kind of static replicas that you want minimum. And then max replica count is used by our uh, horizontal pod autoscaler component. So uh, again, I'll, I'll cover that in just a, just a second. Uh, and then we have an option for max unavailable pods, which is used by a pod disruption budget, which again, I will show in a couple of minutes. Uh, so I'm really just gonna kind of scroll through the rest of these. Um, some standard stuff, if you've used uh, a community chart before, you're gonna recognize some of these values because we've identified those as best patterns. So, um, you know, being able to specify the service account name, uh, being able to add custom pod annotations and labels. Um, we recognize that 
uh, you know, we don't want to provide values for everything. So some of these are, are relatively, uh, relatively free form, uh, where they, you know, they're just expecting lists, or um, uh, whereas you know others are expecting actual objects, um, ingress settings. So again, 62% uh, of the way through, and I've scrolled enough. Uh, so. The first resource I'd like to show is uh, our, deployments ob or our deployment object. Um, pretty standard manifest uh, with the addition of lots of curly braces, uh, which you know, really improves readability, I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it's, a it's a standard manifest uh, that we uh, just have made very configurable. Uh, uh, one particular item of interest here is um, what we've done with this conditional around our rolling update strategy. Uh, we've, we've said if, if uh, we're only deploying one replica, uh, we want to set the maximum unavailable to zero so that when we do a rolling update, we're sure that we still have a pod running you know, during that update. So it'll bring a pod up rather than killing the old pod and bring, you know, before and then not waiting until the new one is, or you know, bringing a pod up and then not waiting until the old one, new one is ready, it makes sure that at least one pod is running during the rolling update. So that uh, is actually something we did, uh, that one of our teams discovered. They were having, you know, they were having outages any time they um, were deploying. You know, best, like best, best practice would be don't run one replica, but um, you know, we try to accommodate. Uh, We've added, uh, let's see, uh, I am role. So this, again, this is a pattern that uh, we use in the community charts repo for uh, AWS specific applications, being able to add the uh, I am role as an annotation. Uh, init containers, there's a, there's a bug in uh, uh, versions of Kubernetes less than 1.8 that ignore the standard init containers. Uh, object, um, so the fix for until 1.8 uh, was to revert to the pod.beta.kubernetes.io slash init containers annotation, so we've accounted for that. Um, let's see, there are, uh, here's the uh, anti-affinity rule that I mentioned in the values file. I think what's of particular interest and what we actually kind of called out in our summary of the talk is uh, the ability to add sidecars to your application. So we've recently uh, started pursuing Jaeger for uh, tracing, distributed tracing. Uh, so we added a Jaeger.enabled uh, flag to our values file. If you set Jaeger.enabled to true, the Jaeger agent gets added as a sidecar. And then we provide other um, uh, configuration points so that if a team is testing a newer version or a different version of the image, uh, they can plug that in. Uh, resources also, uh, this is a pattern that, uh, that Vic mentioned uh, yesterday. Um, and just kind of FYI, you should uh, definitely, when that video is available, check that out because uh, if you contribute to the community repo, we will be very grateful if you follow those patterns like day one. Uh, but in this case, uh, I'm referring to the resources section here where uh, you plug in your resources because your you know different teams are going to discover different resource needs. Um, so this is how we accommodate that. Uh, Fluent D. Uh, some of our teams are using Fluent D for log collection and uh, forwarding. So we have provided a very simple one-off um, configuration point for enabling a Fluent D container uh, sidecar. Uh, we've done the same for Splunk, but what's, what's really kind of interesting is that we acknowledge that we can't cover all the bases. We have no interest in covering all the bases. Uh, 251 you know, lines in our values file is you know, pretty good. We don't need to add you know, options for every possible sidecar that somebody might want to deploy. So uh, we have uh, here uh, just a plain, if, if you want to provide a custom sidecar, um, just give us the YAML and we inject that right into the manifest and then that gets added to your pod. Um, there's, yeah, there's you know, plenty more in this deployment file that I would love to go into, but uh, 
I also want to give Raphael a chance to talk at some point. So uh, what I'll do next is show uh, our service. So uh, just like we want to be able to uh, enable sidecar uh, containers, we want to uh, enable Prometheus, like one-touch uh, Prometheus metrics scraping. So we have a metrics.enabled value. You set that to true, and Helm adds these annotations uh, to the service, and then our standard Prometheus configuration starts scraping those services, scraping the metrics off of those services uh, automatically. Um, let's see, then, the other thing I wanted to point out in the service is, is right here. Um, we have a conditional, we wrap uh, our service type in a conditional here. So when we deploy to AWS, uh, we set the platform value to AWS. And if we're requesting an ingress, we set ingress.enabled equals true. The way the ALB ingress controller works is that it, uh, you know, it, it requires a node port to be exposed. It attaches to the node, you know, the, the node's port. So uh, we have this conditional that says if those if those two values are set, uh, the service is going to be of type node port. If it's if they're not set, then they, you know, it doesn't get set explicitly, and the default Kubernetes behavior is to provision a cluster IP service. Uh, we have discovered uh, that this, it, it's not quite a binary thing, so uh, this is probably something we need to revisit soon. Um, we have services that are not deployed to AWS and do need to be node ports, and you know, they're not always going to be cluster IP services, you know, even though these conditions aren't met. So um, again, that's, that's something we learn, and as we do, we make changes and everybody benefits. Uh, speaking of ingress, let's take a look. Um, here the entire manifest is wrapped in a conditional. So if ingress, if, a, if an ingress isn't required, we don't bother creating the resource. You know, pretty straightforward. Um, but here again, if uh, we're deploying to AWS, then we need to add a set of uh, annotations that the ALB ingress controller uses to provision those application load balancers. Um, and there are quite a few of them. Uh, AWS provides a wealth of, uh, of options, configurability, and uh, the ALB ingress makes, uh, does, uh, really does a good job of supporting them all. So uh, if you have a uh, TLS certificate that you want to attach to the ALB, um, you can provide that, you can provide its ARN here. Um, you set the health check. Uh, et cetera, all of these options, um, some of which are kind of sub-templated. Uh, for example, the security groups. Um, if, uh, oops, <laughs> that's not what I wanted. Come on. Um, we have a, a helper template that uh, lists uh, our, our subnet names um, Based on uh, the type of sub, uh, based on the type of ALB we're asking for, if we're asking for an internet-facing ingress, then it puts uh, the security groups and the subnets that correspond to our public-facing infrastructure in those annotations. If they are internal-only ALB uh, endpoints, then we use a different set of security groups and uh, subnets. Uh, so that that kind of covers uh, how we deploy or how we handle the AWS case. If we're deploying to uh, our on-prem on clusters, as Raphael mentioned, we use a shared Nginx ingress controller in those clusters. So we, so we don't need the AWS annotations. We just need one that sets the class to, uh, in our case, shared Nginx. And then here we have you know, a few of the usual suspects, uh, you know, annotations and um, we can set host name. We actually do have a, another helper template that will provide a default uh, fully qualified domain name that can be overridden by teams if they want to use you know, their own custom host name. Uh, as promised, I'm not gonna go into config maps. They're really pretty, pretty bare bones um, for the most part. Uh, Fluentd is just kind of a default uh, configuration. Config map, uh, the config map YAML is uh, basically empty. All we do is you feed in, you feed in, 
uh, a key value of you know what's your what's your uh, config name uh, your config map um, key should be, and then you feed in the data, and we just stick it right in the manifest. It's it's super elegant. Um, what I will show though. Uh, because I mentioned it earlier, is the horizontal pod autoscaler. So this is where um, those two values, max replica, replica count and max replica count, come into play. If you provide both of them and uh, you specify a higher max than, uh, you know, kind of min, I guess we could have called it min, um, then it will create this manifest and it will use those values in the, in the appropriate fields. So in the spec, you have max replicas and you have min replicas. Um, you'll, uh, anybody who knows uh, the HPA realizes the, that it is, uh, if, you've, if you have the custom metrics API enabled, um, you can scale based on uh, you know, uh, Prometheus metrics, for example. And this, this, that's something that we'd really like to offer like soon to our dev teams. Um, they are really keenly interested in being able to scale based on things like uh, requests per second, you know, being able to spin up new pods when you hit uh, a threshold. Um, for now, though, uh, we are using just the base functionality, which is CPU. Um, so what the, what the HPA does is it looks at the average CPU usage across pods, and when it, when it exceeds a, a, a given threshold, it will create more pods up to your maximum until that threshold is no longer being met. So um, a little bit, yeah, inside Kubernetes, not really inside, but uh, bonus Kubernetes information. Uh, the last one I'm going to show is pod, uh, pod disruption budget. This is uh, a relatively newish resource uh, that we are also finding pretty uh, convenient. This is when we're doing when we're doing manual node uh, maintenance. Say we need to take a node down uh, for whatever reason. Uh, when you do a cube drain, it's first going to look at your pod disruption budget and make sure that you keep, that it that the scheduler keeps your max unavailable pods, that number of, uh, of pods, um, it's, it's gonna affect no more than that number of pods during a maintenance, uh, uh, um, during maintenance. So uh, this is, again, something that was highlighted by an application team. Uh, they were wondering why, they're, you know, why uh, um, all of their pods or why would they were returning 500s, you know, at the same time that we were taking a pod down for maintenance? At, at maintenance, and it's because uh, of a few things. I mean, you know, all of their pods got co-scheduled, which, you know, <laughs> oops. Um, but something like this, you know, the pod DB is meant to address that, so that even if you do get co-scheduled, this will make sure that at, you know that uh, X number of pods will be will be up and running before it kills the rest of them. So it, it comes in very handy. Um, you'll notice we have a conditional around this manifest as well. This, uh, so if uh, release.isinstall is a Helm condition uh, that says, you know, we're only gonna create this if this is an initial installation. Uh, the reason is that the PDB, at least as we understand it, the PDB is currently immutable. So if you try to change a pod disruption budget after it's been created, your uh, Helm is gonna flip out a little bit. Um, you're gonna get an error message that it, you know, uh, resource already exists or something, or you know, field cannot be changed. So uh, there are a couple of issues I know about that are open on this. Um, so hopefully that gets addressed soon. Uh, we are, I am running super long, so at this point, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Raphael to try to squ squeeze into the last five yeah, minutes. Like <laughs> 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 Can I get that mic? Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Oh. All right, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, all right, so I'm just gonna run really quickly through an example of deploying um, our uh, deployment essentially with the web service chart. Um, let's see, if you're interested, the code is available on my GitHub, Raffles, uh, Hello KubeCon. It's pretty minimal. It's, it's just, it's not actually going to include the web service chart or anything, but if you wanna go and look at the files in more detail that I'm pulling up, that's where it is. Uh, what the example does, just 
basic Go application, like hello world, it's gonna run Go tests, it's gonna um, build the application, push the container image to our uh, container registry, which in our case is ECR, Amazon ECR, and then uh, finally deploy the application using the web service chart in Helm. Oh, thank you. So this is the app in question. Uh, as you can see, it just says hello KubeCon. I'm gonna just show you the files here really quickly. Simple Go app. Um, here's the test. My hands are shaking like I was hoping they wouldn't. <laughs> um, this is, you know, just checking to make sure the status code is 200 and that the message is as intended. Um, and let's see what else. So this values file, this is a more minimal one as, uh, you know, you don't have to fill in, a lot of those values are just already defaulted in the other thing. So here's like a kind of minimal example for what you would need to deploy this. Uh, as you can see, I'm just, the important stuff here is that I'm telling it, hey, use the app. I'm gonna, this is where I'm gonna push the uh, container. So <clears throat> that's probably the most important thing. Um, this is shared values that will be used both for AWS and on-prem. If we look at one of the others, you'll see I also filled in the fully qualified domain name and the platform is on-prem. So yeah, you can specify multiple values files for Helm and it'll use a, you know, they can override each other and stuff. These are completely, not overlapping, so uh, that's not even really a consideration. Anyway, so we can go to the um, website. I already deployed this, so we wouldn't have to wait for the, um, whoops, how do I do that? Three fingers. Three fingers, yes. Yep. This way. No. Oh. And then you need the tab, right? Yep. There you go. Whoops. I also need the uh, FQDN. Oops. Ah. Uh. So, you know, the, whoops, we have to be on the, <laughs> these are internal only, so we have to get on the VPN, so might, I've, yeah, we intended to do that earlier. So yeah, hello KubeCon, that would be showing up there. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's only, it's not exposed externally, we would have had to configure that separately. I did not put that annotation on there, or up, yeah, so we won't be able to see the hello KubeCon, but you can use your imagination, it's just regular text. Um, what we were going to do next, I, I can do it, but it will be far less exciting, is uh, modify that message or the FQDN and then do a get push, you know, so we could go over here. Um, so yeah, just imagine that, that we had seen the hello KubeCon in the web browser. It's really there, I promise you. Um, let's see, what else? Oh yes, the test will not be happy if we don't change that as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, so you know, the point is that once we do this, uh, I didn't go over actually what GitLab uh, runners are, but you're probably familiar with them in some flavor or another. It's a lot like Jenkins or Travis CI. And essentially we're just running some code in a, uh, you know, defined con the container of choice. Um, and so, you know, we, whoops. Oh yeah, well we need to be on the VPN to push as well. So, uh, so there we go, that was, <laughs> but yeah, next you would have seen that the message changed after a moment. Um, yeah, so now if you have any questions or, yeah, and if you have questions about the, any of this, you can contact us there, Mike's on Twitter, or you can see my email address. <laughs>